You're about to listen to Free Talk Live's Weekly Digest, some of the best segments from last week's Free Talk Live, as collected by super activist Benjamin Bartholomew. Don't forget, you can listen to every hour of Free Talk Live by going to freetalklive.com. <laughs> Story from the Pacific Standard, psmag.com. A couple months ago, the sex education notice that came home in my nine-year-old son's backpack I didn't realize in our district, sex ed starts in the fourth grade. Another sign of the state having more access to my baby than sometimes I wish. When I handed the note to my mate at the dinner table, our son said, uh, with something of a proud smile, I told Ms. Reverbree we've already talked about it at home, unquote. The maid and I looked at each other and obviously had the same thought. Two weeks before, the class had been learning about electricity. The teacher had gotten stuck on some questions about batteries, so she turned to our son, who was able to explain to the class exactly how batteries charge, recharge, and discharge. He's learned a lot about electricity at home, and quite a lot about sex. You know, my mate said to our son, this is one of those times when you have to not help the teacher, even if you know how something works. <laughs> I busted out laughing at the admonition. Your dad is right, I said, composing myself. It's entirely possible that you know more about sex than they do, but there's some stuff some parents might not want their kids to know, so you have to keep a lid on it. I know, he answered. But really, this was the kid who in preschool answered a teacher's good morning, how are you today, with a, I'm fine, but my mother is menstruating, so her uterine lining is sloughing. Oh boy. I just shrugged and explained to her that he'd seen blood on the toilet paper and he wanted to know if I was okay. So I'd explained that it was normal and he wanted to hear about the mechanics, like he always does about everything. Now, Mark, you've got a six-year-old son now? Is That's he six right. Now? Can you relate to this? I mean, the the wanting to know about everything? You know, yeah, he wants to know. Yes, he, he asks lots, of, lots and lots of questions. Uh, and, you know, young people ask questions like this. Children, in this case, ask questions like this. And a lot of parents don't want to be forthright with the answers. If it's if it's the wrong question or a question that uh, that makes them feel uncomfortable. Well, I don't know that, that kids necessarily always want to know as much as this young man wants to know. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, they might ask questions, uh, but... A lot of times, I really kind of think that, you know, that they, they want half the answer that I give. Hmm. Like, I have a tendency to over-answer questions, and I get the impression that, uh, that my son Jack would just prefer if I gave him a short answer. She laughed. As he went off to play, she reminded me of the time that the class had somehow gotten onto the discussion of baby cows, and one child had posed the question of how the cow gets out of the mommy's tummy. But then, uh, teachers glanced nervously at each other until one of them sputtered, Through the birth canal! My son's hand shot up. Is that the same as the vagina? Oh, God. Apparently, he also pointed out How that helpful. <laughs> the baby must be in a uterus, not a tummy, because if the baby was in the stomach, it would get digested, and that wouldn't be good. He does know. Yeah. This was also the only kid in preschool who said, most boys have penises and scrotums, and most girls have clitorises and vaginas. I presume it's because my son knows so much about sex that sometimes his friends have tried to ask me questions. <laughs> I never know what to do in such a situation. Ordinarily, I'll answer all children's questions in an honest manner and make sure I evince no shame about the question or the answer, whether it's about war, disability, disease, sex, arguments between neighbors, whatever. But in this cultural climate of negativity around sex, can I really answer another person's child's question about sex? One day, nine-year-old Elaine started asking me about birth control out of the blue. I said to her, listen, I need to call your parents and ask them if it's okay for me to talk to you about this, okay? She said that'd be fine, so I did. I didn't expect her mother's response. Oh, God, yes, please answer any questions she has. And tell her it's okay to go to you any time with those questions, said her mom. <coughs> I told her that that'd be fine, but that I'd also ask Elaine if it were okay for me to just let her mother know what we talked about. My mate has always been a little more reserved with adult information. This is a general difference between us, one that's pretty apparent to everyone. A friend once asked our son what it's like to be raised by Auntie Mam and Kermit the Frog, but I have to be forthcoming with the goods, especially when it comes to sex. My work on children born with atypical sex has put me in the position of advising other parents that it's critical to be calm and honest in response to children's questions about sex. I kind of have to practice what I preach. 
It's a problem, though, that I've become so comfortable talking with children about sex because most adults aren't. And we've got a pedophile panicked culture that just seems to be adding to the great silence. One time, my son was out to lunch with a friend and me, and the friend and I were talking about my work on intersex. My son stopped me to ask me to remind him what intersex is. I explained we were talking about people who have a different kind of sex anatomy than the average boy or the average girl. I explained that, for example, some of them have a short penis or big clitoris. Oh, right, he answered. I reminded him of the names of a few friends of ours who are intersex, so he'd remember we we're talking about real people. Suddenly, I became aware that the tables all around us had gone silent. I bet they had. Then there was the time in third grade when my son wanted to bring our pet rat Treacle in for show and tell. After my son and I Please had Please tell me they have an intersex rat. Treacle's care and question and feeding his habits and his relations with us, one little boy had a question. What's under Treacle's tail? And we'll find out here in a moment. <laughs> What's under Treacle's tail? And this brings up a larger question, a larger discussion about talking with kids about sex. What's the appropriate thing to do? It's, you know, should the answer be, oh, well, the stork flies in and brings the baby? Or should you get a little more detailed and be honest? But first we go to Kickstart. He's actually calling from the FTL chat room. He's listening on the Internet. Welcome, Kickstart. What's on your mind? Hi, Stephanie, uh, Brian, Mark. Glad to be calling in, and uh, really glad for the work that you do. Um, oh, thank you. Right nice to hear your voice. I've I've corresponded thank with you. you by email, but I'm not sure if we've yes. ever talked on the phone. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I've been frustrated with this flash bang baby story, and you know I, I've been talking about it for the past couple of days with friends, family, anyone who will listen, basically. And mm-hmm. uh, you know I, I was chatting about it in the chat room. Spent about 20 minutes trying to t- tone down my views a little bit. And there are a few others that agree with my sentiments that I'm about to say. And, you know, I don't like the monopoly on force by the government, but I also kind of wonder if it's, you know, in the realm of a good idea to put the monopoly of force to not be one. So, you know, put the use of force back into the hands of people to deliver justice for this blown up baby. I mean, what can we do now to shame the cops to end no knock raids? You know, that that's really, really what I, I want to get at. And, um, you know, I also want to know what your thoughts are on whether or not this is a case where people really should go to the extreme of considering vigilante justice now i'm gonna hang up now because i want to listen to your response oh, you oh, don't okay. have to we can have a conversation about it but uh it's up to you yep yeah. uh, i think Thanks. do you have thoughts on it mark yeah i'm sure i i, I you know i'd love Thanks to see start for the call by the way yep I, i'd love to see the um the the historical evidence that vigilante justice works any better than uh shaming works um i think that we have the shaming mechanisms now with social media Far more than we had in the past, um, yeah. and it's working. It's waking, it, making its way around. Every one of these stories that goes around convinces another few people out there that, huh, maybe we don't just assume that every time uh, somebody who's got a government who's got a flag on their uh, you know shoulder does something that it's the right, just, and pure thing. Mm, and it may convince some. Some of those people are cops, and they say wow, well, if I don't think about my actions before I do this, I could be facing a PR nightmare like this in the future or a dead baby potentially. And, uh, you know, I I do think that works, Mark. It's not going to bring back the baby. It's not going to give him back his life. Uh, if he survives, he probably won't. But even if he does, he's going to have a, a difficult life. Uh, it's not going to bring back the baby, but neither will vigilante justice. I, so, it won't. Um, it won't, and it will also probably create something that, you know, can be spun off and exploited as, see, this is why we need the cops. This is why we need to give them the power to crush uprisings, because they... And know. remember every story, no one's going to, if there's a, okay, so let's say that uh, we, we somehow convince, we, we advocate for vigilante justice and somehow convince somebody who's listening to us to, uh, you know, go out and sneakily shoot one of these cops that uh, did this. I'm not advocating for any of this. Um, no, neither am I. Let's make that abundantly clear. Yeah. But if such a thing did occur, 
you would get the corresponding news media story that then would be like, you know, here's the weeping wife, here's the weeping child, and, you know, the whole thing. It just takes it just turns it around and gives the um the sympathy back towards the perpetrators and i i think what we need to do is is this is a societal problem this isn't the police that are doing this this isn't the police chief this isn't the sheriff this isn't the politicians this is every single one of, uh, not every single one, the majority of us that just don't care. People that would rather read People magazine or Us magazine or the sports page or whatever that are so tuned out that they don't know what's going on in their world. I'm not saying they're morally culpable for this. I'm saying that this is the result. When you turn over responsibility for security in your community to an organization that has no responsibility for their action, or at the least very little responsibility, with qualified immunity, here's a surprise, people. Flashbang grenades are going to go off in babies' faces. That's what's going to happen. This is the natural result of not taking responsibility for this. You can't turn something over to a monopoly and expect good customer service. It doesn't happen. The marketplace doesn't do this, and the police are a monopoly or a near monopoly. They're at least a cartelized force. And through social media, like you mentioned, that message is getting out. And that's very valuable i mean it's nothing should have to cost a baby's life or a person's life at all but people are at least finding out about it and i think you're right mark that the average person now is going to be more aware of things like this happening i mean i actually hate to talk about this stuff it's very depressing Mm -hmm. you feel powerless to do anything about it because we are we can't do anything about it it already happened this baby is hurt and thousands of other incidents like this are going to happen in the future and Really, all we can do or the best thing that we can do, I I think, is talk about it and let people know about it so that hopefully it it can be prevented. It's, you know, it's a worse. This is like the worst thing that could happen, you know, in in this situation. No, No doubt about that. And these 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 people, especially to say you need to pray for the police officers, for the SWAT team guys, is oh, is horrendous. The hubris, yeah. Yeah. Now, what well, the, the sheriff says. Yeah. Now, what the community needs to do. Okay, or what I would want the community to do, what I would want, say I was this, this father, father to this kid, I would want not, I, I wouldn't want justice done by the butt of a gun, or not by the butt, but, you know, by the bullet, whatever. I would want this guy to lose his job, but he has a job elsewhere, and I want 75% or maybe 80%, pick the percentage of everything he makes going into my kid's bank account. For the rest of his life, See, and that, and something like I want reparations. That this this person ending getting the, that person's life ended does nothing. You know, I mean, and, yeah. it, it, it really and it's it costs costly. nothing. Yeah. It, the thing is, is that you know when so sharing on social media is nearly costless. You're going through your social media feed. You see something that makes you happy. See something that makes you inspired. See something that makes you chuckle. You see something that makes you upset. Right? Like this is the this is the experience of people going through social media. Okay, so the share, the like, the comment, these things are nearly costless. Uh, comments, in my opinion, are costly, and I don't uh, generally participate in them, but if I do, I often regret it. They, they cost you time. Yeah, yeah uh, but and, and you get nothing, generally nothing in yep. return. Nobody's mind gets changed, that's Rare, for sure. Rarely the case, but um, it, what it, you can say is that it drives up the visibility of the post, and then maybe it'll get seen by more people. So anyway... The the share or the what you know, and I think that's the best thing you can do in this circumstance is just just share, just share it with your friends, show the story to more people, and that's nearly costless. Whereas going out and being a proficient shot um, with a sniper rifle, um, skulking about uh, you know in the dark of night for days and days until you get the opportunity to to take that one deadly shot. Um, the fact that you have to separate yourself from your family and friends because they're going to wonder where you are and why you have grease paint on your face, um, you know, and all these things that are sort of the 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 necessity if you're going to do vigilante justice, it's just not there's not going to be the the pitchforks and torches. You're not going to get a bunch of people behind you. Hey, let's go, uh, you know, go to the police station and stop this crap. That's not going to happen. And you're not going to, even if you get a band, a small band, if you try to get them to do something, they're going to snitch on you. If you try to do it as one person and you actually have a life, you're never going to be able to do it. If you don't have a life, you are probably already going to do it anyway. So I don't, you know, there's there's no conversation to have around just a vigilante justice. No, it's not restorative, and that's 
all that really matters with any any wrong doing being done upon another is there has to be restoration for what happened. And I'm just, just saying it's impractical. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's a battle that is never going to end, and that we're like the people, quote unquote, are never going to win either because the government always has more and bigger weapons. They always they have unlimited resources on their side, virtually unlimited, to um, to crush you with, and so. Fighting a violent battle against the government isn't going to work, so you know, and it may back, it may actually backfire and do worse. It's a terrible situation all around, and I wish we had better answers. I wish it never happened in the first place. Uh, but you know, important talking to talk about, about it's it. the only answer I've got, and it's yeah. so yeah, so far it's working. Light. Things shine are changing. But first, uh, a word from our sponsors. Yeah, and I think actually this sponsor here is one you want to listen to and jump on if you're concerned about what that story is going to be about with Google in the EU. And it's ProXPN. Oh, okay? yes, definitely. And what ProXPN is, it's a VPN, a virtual private network. But what a VPN is, it's a service that allows you, you install some software, you install an app on your computer, on your tablet, on your smartphone, you take your pick. Okay, iOS, Android, Linux, OS X, Windows. You put that on there in every single bit of communication that goes out, every data packet, every mi- every piece of metadata that goes out from your computer, doesn't matter what piece of software you're sending it from, on your computer, tablet, or smartphone, is going to get encrypted with the finest, really some of the finest encryption we have on the planet. Right, using- because normally when you uh, browse the web or whatever, check your email, enter passwords and stuff like that, the information that has to go from your computer to your ISP internet service provider and and then they you know then you can go stuff go places online but that means that your ISP knows exactly what you're looking at sure. online or not just your ISP anyone it's out in the open it's out there mm-hmm. you, you know what i mean it, it, for anyone with uh, with the means and the tools to get use of and that means also if it goes to the ISP if your employer or some other bad actor group, whatever it may be. <laughs> Your employer uh, or some other bad person. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, if they want, if they, they can request, hey, I want their data. And they can hand it over unless you're using ProXPN. And what I love about ProXPN personally is is the ease of use. It's oh, yeah. easy to use. It is. It, it really Genuinely. just takes, you You know, click. It, it'll, it'll come on when the computer comes on, and you don't have to worry about it. If I uh, put the computer to sleep or change a location, I just have to click connect again and then i'm back online and back in business but other than that i don't have any i don't have to do anything my youtube videos come through i'm able to watch those at speed and you know it's just not a problem yeah and and you'll get a nice especially on the computer on the desktop you'll get a nice little green light saying hey you're good you're good to go uh you you really you want to use this and and the ease of use is important because i know i'm a tech guy i've been using vpns for years i used to build my own certificate files my own pem files it was such a pain in the butt none of that exists with pro xpn this is world class stuff here uh uses open vpn i can't recommend a higher use code ftl20 get 20 percent off or you can use bitcoin yes they support liberty they support the bitcoin community you can use bitcoin and get an even greater discount okay go to proxpn.com slash ftl isaac in west virginia listening to wvts you're on the air hi glad to be here welcome go ahead sir. um love your show just add that uh Thanks. i have two things that i was going to say the first thing is I think that uh, we have a re- very over-criminalized penal system. I mean, I think it's ridiculous. Like, take, for example, some teenager sends an explicit photo of themselves to someone else. That's the only distribution of child pornography Yeah. with all the terrible things that go along with that. But the second thing I was going to mention was just that you were talking about uh, things that would uh, better correction type systems. Sure. And, I mean, I- I've worked with a lot of felons. And they all talk about the stuff they got away with and how it wasn't too bad in there. And I was just thinking that work crews, I know, I know some people that have had experience with that and they have came out really well afterward. And so a work crew, over meaning all. like going out and doing the slave labor for the for the county? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they, they can build a skill. I mean, I, I do road construction during the summers between college. And uh, I work with people who have uh, built built skills that have allowed them to get uh, jobs that that pay over minimum wage and uh, after they get out of prison. Well, that's awesome. 
Yeah, I wouldn't say shoveling horse manure would be a skill that it was particularly <laughs> valuable. So I guess there's a range of options as far as the work you can do in a jail. Usually, if you're shoveling horse manure, you have other, uh, you know, other <laughs> jobs uh, involved. Rare, rare is the person whose sole task is horse manure shoveling. Well, there were people whose job it was was to go down and take care of the stables at the uh, the Cheshire County Fairgrounds. It was one of their jobs at the jail. Yep. And I imagine that's mostly shoveling poo. I th- I honestly think that uh, your your wages uh, depend uh, largely on your attitude, um, your willingness to learn, and you don't your get wages in jail, Mark. In prison, you can actually get money, but in jail, I'm talking about when you get out. If oh, you have a, I see. If you're a convict and you get out and you think the world sucks and you think that somebody owes you something, it's I got attitude, news for you. Yeah. It's going to suck, and nobody's going to yep. feel like they owe you anything. That's certainly true. Isaac, thanks for calling tonight. appreciate it. Let's go to Tom in Maryland. You're on Free Talk Live. Tom. Hey, good evening, gentlemen. Go ahead. This is a real interesting conversation. Great. As far as alternatives, I would venture to take a stab at that and guess that it probably, a good alternative probably lies both for the penalizing of people who commit crimes and for the reform of the system in incentives and disincentives. Now, I don't think the last guy had a bad idea as far as putting people to work, but I don't think it should be something that is necessarily mandatory, nor do I think they should be paid a a pittance while they're doing it. I think if you Again, getting back to the incentives and disincentives, I think if you give them an incentive to want to go ahead and work on the highways for a decent wage, it would solve the problem of them leaving there with 10, 20 bucks in their pocket. Uh, It would get them into what's been proven to be beneficial, a habit of doing uh, work uh, and seeing what type of money they can accrue uh, by saving it, because of course they're not going to be able to blow it in a weekend while they're behind bars mm-hmm. at the end of the day. And I think also you have to always, and I think your warden or superintendent up there has it right, I think you really can never lose sight of the fact that these are human beings and you have to respect them. And a respect usually begets respect. And I think once you start looking at them as something other than being human beings, uh, you disempower them. When you don't have options, uh, you disempower them. And I think any time that you use disempowerment and removal of personal responsibility and accountability, I don't think it ever works as well as empowering an individual and placing in their hands the responsibility and accountability for their actions, including penance and restoration if it's needed and self-reform self-correction if you will well i'd Um, also say that it um another incentive that it removes and this is a good incentive to remove is is that they've shown uh in the past like for instance in uh, some of the southern states that convictions would go up around harvest time because well we need more inmates to do the harvesting and so they would uh you know they the judges be like oh yeah let's convict some more people and then of course they'd let them out after the harvest is uh is done so y- when you have situations where inmates are paid less than market wages and they're not able to uh, just opt out of the work you have a situation where they're you know, they're being used as uh, slave labor prison labor and that incentivizes the system to keep them if you have somebody who's and working add more. right if you have somebody who's working for you for less than market wages do you want to keep them or do you want to see them get out and do well? Which is one of the reasons why I have this big uh, prison industrial complex. They keep arresting people for drugs and then they can turn them into slave labor. Thanks, Tom, for the call tonight. I appreciate hearing from you. So there's actually quite a bit more uh, to this, several paragraphs more on this vice story. We're not going to get through it all, so you can look at it on your own time. But there's one more, at least one more statement here from Rick Van Wickler, the, uh, the warden of the, the jail in this case, I think is really worth sharing. So let me get to that here. As one of the groups that could benefit most, Van Wickler believes, is nonviolent drug offenders. As a member of, law, of uh, law enforcement against prohibition, the warden is adamantly against the drug war. He explains, I've seen people come into this institution for drug violations. I've seen the cost not only to the taxpayer, but the social costs, the cost of parents being away from their children. 
Contrary to what a lot of media has portrayed and what law enforcement believes, not every person in jail for drug possession is a bad parent. The author of the article asks, why do you think that's such a common opinion? He says, I think they believe what they see on television, that you take a hit off a joint and the next thing you know you're on the bathroom floor with a needle in your arm. What the American public just cannot seem to understand is how much drug use there is in our country. Question from the author, how do you think they can be made to understand? Well, let's think about alcohol for a moment. The majority of people who drink alcohol in this country have no problems with it. They're alcohol users. They drink on the 4th of July and barbecues and at the Super Bowl. Then think about somebody who's an abuser of alcohol, meaning that they use alcohol much more than they should. But they're still working. They still have a house. They're still in a relationship. Finally, think about an alcohol addict, an alcoholic. Their lives have been destroyed by alcohol. Now, you can have the exact, or you can take the exact same analogy and just replace alcohol with drugs, heroin, cocaine, meth. You have users, abusers, and addicts in pretty much the same ratios. Let's not be so damn naive and say that we in America don't have professional people that are addicts because we all know that's not accurate. We have professional people who are heroin addicts, who have been heroin addicts for years and are meeting the standards of their employment. That's happening, and to deny it is an atrocity. I agree. It's hard not to agree, right? What a strong statement. Yeah. That's why I love Rick Van Wickler. I mean, he, he says what needs to be said from a position of, you know, we don't believe in authority, but other people do. He says it from this position of guy running the jail. Guy who would like to release 40% of his prisoners, but if he did that, the judge would put him in the jail. So he's not willing to put his own butt on the line to just set a group of prisoners free. He'd but never he, be able to treat any other any of them well after that. He is willing to put his reputation on the line and speak out in favor of ending the war on drugs. And uh, for that, and for being a relatively relatively humane uh, person operating a uh, correctional facility, he deserves kudos. And so, way to go, Rick. <laughs> I went to the dentist yesterday, and uh, the gal that was cleaning teeth there, I'm not sure, she called a hygienist, Mm -hmm. um, she said that she thought that my teeth looked great. She complimented my hygiene, that's the terminology she used, and uh, was just sort of very impressed with my oral health and said that she'd seen improvements over the last time that I had come. Well, the one thing I've changed is, is I'm using my magic mud. My Magic Mud is a it's a powder, a tooth powder, which you know, frankly isn't that unusual. Tooth powders existed before toothpastes did, but I think they've kind of fallen out of fashion to some extent. But the My Magic Mud is um, it's it's a powder that has it's benzenite clay and activated charcoal, and it sort of just grabs the bacteria in your mouth and yanks them out of there. So you don't if you've got, uh, for instance, periodontal issues. This is a great thing to use. I certainly had that, and um, I believe it's I believe it's you know leaps and bounds. My mouth's in a lot better shape, and I think that my magic mud is helping it. Also, it's uh, it's great whitener. It within four applications, my teeth were just a lot lot whiter. Um, the I, I drink coffee every day. In the first application, I saw a difference, but uh, by three, you know, the, in the three applications, I was just about done, and by four, I was I was completely done. This is a two-minute normal brushing with, uh, you know, at the normal time of day that I would brush. I'm not taking 20 minutes to put chemicals in my mouth. It, the stuff's so safe, you can just swallow it. You don't you don't do that with toothpaste, folks. Hmm. But you can swallow this if if you wish. It was created by Jessica Armand, a living loving liberty loving homeschool mother of three. And she's going to be attending Porkfest this year, and you'll, you'll be able to try out My Magic Mud there. Plenty of jars for sale in Agra Valley. And if you want to get one yourself, go to MyMagicMud.com. I recommend it highly. I could not recommend it more highly. Everybody who I know who's used this, including you, Ian, yes, raising about, raving about it. My wife thinks it's great. MyMagicMud.com. Uh, go to the website. I, I had a listener online IM me and say they, they thought it was awesome, too. Cool. Yep, go to the mymagicmud.com. Mark, do you brush up and down or side to side? In order to use this, I'm going in circles to make mm. sure that I get in the, um, the little cracks. Now, I use a sonic toothbrush, which I've found to be better. I recommend that, too. Yeah, and, they, are, they are pretty great. And so I don't know what the little bristles are doing while I'm going round and round with my hand. Cause they're of, buzzing very, very fast. Yes, they're doing something. They're going some direction, up, down, or whatever. But it's uh, really working out. I love this stuff. 
but it's black. It'll surprise you when mm-hmm. you're brushing with it. <laughs> MyMagicMud.com. All last night, uh, we teased the story that Mark, you had brought in about seasteading, which you're a big fan of. And we never actually got to it because we ended up spending pretty much the whole show talking about uh, different jail techniques and operations of jails and how things are different here in Cheshire County, etc. So we never got to it. So let's do it now, shall we? Yeah. This Where's article, it from? Uh, from Bloomberg.com. It's, uh, this article does a reasonably good job of explaining what seat setting is, so I'm not going to do that. Okay. Um, but, uh, of course, we have to have the, uh, the, the little story as, a, as to start it all off with. As dawn breaks over the Gulf of Fun. Fonseca, I've never been very good at these foreign words. Southeast of El Salvador, Patri Friedman sets out for a jog. He trots past domed hothouses filled with fruit trees and feels the sidewalk sway gently underfoot as a tugboat chugs by with a floating apartment building in tow. The year is 2024, and Friedman lives in the so-called Seastead, a water-bound city of some 1,000 people who produce their own food, their own energy, and most important, their own laws. That's the dream that Friedman, a libertarian software engineer at Google Inc., and the uh, grandson of Nobel, uh, Memori- the Nobel Memorial Prize winning economist Milton Friedman, is working to make a reality. As Bloomberg Pursuits will report in its summer 2014 issue, Friedman is chairman of the Seasteading Institute, an Oakland, California-based group financed with $1.2 million in seed money from PayPal, Inc.'s billionaire Peter Thiel. Now, I remember they had uh, uh, half a million at one point, so one point two, I guess maybe they got a little extra. Sweet. The five-year-old organization is pursuing an ambitious aquatic mission to develop floating micro-countries that will dwell in international waters with the same sovereign status enjoyed by cruise ships. Think secessionist, do-it-yourself nation-building meets the 1995 post-apocalyptic science fiction stinker Waterworld. Water world. You got it. You know, nobody can talk about seasteading without talking about Waterworld. Okay. What the hell did Waterworld have to do with building your, auton- your own autonomous, uh, uh, you know, living environment on the water? I have no clue. I've never actually seen it. Nothing is the answer. <laughs> Nothing. I mean, it just... I guess people just want to say Waterworld when you say seasteading. I don't know. Well, Waterworld, from from seeing the previews, all I know about it was there's people living on the water. <laughs> there, yeah, there are certainly people living on the water. In, in the boats. movie. Yeah. Not, on, not in what... Uh, well, but, isn't the seastead basically just a big boat? I don't know how you... Like a huge platform that floats? I mean, how do you define a boat? Is a platform a boat? It depends on who you uh, ask as to what a seastead is. Mm-hmm. Now, there was an organization called Blue Seed, which was going to take uh, you know, some cruise ship that didn't need to cruise as much anymore, that wasn't cruising as much anymore, refurb which would be it. a boat. Yeah, refurb it and turn it into a platform on which people could live just outside of the uh, territorial waters of the United States near Silicon Valley. And that way, people who would otherwise not be able to work in the United States could work essentially 20 miles away from Silicon Valley, which it takes that long to get anywhere anyway um, in Silicon Valley. I mean, mm-hmm. it's a, you know, it's, it's sprawl as it could possibly be. So I thought that was an interesting idea. They had sort of a more down to earth uh, concept. You know, we'll, maybe we'll build a platform, whatever it takes, we'll do it. Whereas uh, the Seasteading Institute is really looking at how to create uh, cities on the water, what that looks like. Now I've had conversations with Patri about this and He's against the idea of people living in boats. He says Mm. people could live on boats now. If people wanted to live on boats, they would live on boats. So he's not involved with the Blue Seed then? Not particularly. The Blue Seed guys kind of uh, spun off and they thought they were going to do something. But Blue Seed's essentially defunct. Is it? Okay. Um, I mean, it's basically gone at this point. Already? I mean, it's a shame. I really like the idea, but it it doesn't look like it's going to come along. So, you know. That anyway, um, so see we'll shove that in the dustbin of the move here projects. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, so the uh, the fact is that uh, seasteading they're they're looking at how to create cities. You know, break apart cities where you could take your domicile and float off to someplace else. I don't know if this is doable. I think you've got to have well, a. If you've got enough money, I imagine it is. There's a big waves out in the ocean. Yeah. And I don't know how you're going to decide platforms or whatever they're going to be out there. Somebody can d- do it. I guess um, that's true. But to me, what makes sense, what I've, uh, I love the idea, but what makes sense to me, buy a cruise ship, sell berths in it like you sell a condominium, 
and get liberty lovers to, you know, how many liberty lovers do you need on a, on a cruise ship to have a reasonably good life? How many people can do their job from anywhere in the world as long as they've got an Internet connection? I think this could this is possible. And then you'd have, you know, whatever it is you wanted your autonomous floating city thing out in the water. Right. But I get what they're trying to do at Seastead. It's a Seasteading Institute, and I, I support it. Okay. So let's go on here. This isn't the mother of all tax dodges. Moving to Cyprus is a lot less of a, a lift than building your own Atlantis. What is a lift, Johnny Ray? It says it's a lot less of a lift. Is it L-I-F-T lift? L-I-F-T lift than building your own Atlantis. I'm afraid I can't help you. Yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. This is some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of aphorism that I'm not used to. Friedman and fellow traveler Thiel are also something more, uh, they're after something more audacious. Settling the sea offers a way to opt out of an overregulated society, Friedman says, and invent new forms of governance that stoke innovation. And I love it when Patry gets on and talks about this, because this is the, the real crux of it. If you're listening to me and you think that the United States um, way of doing government here is just the end of it all, that we're never going to come up with another better way of doing government, then you haven't spent much time thinking about it. You haven't looked at history much. The fact that, you know, somehow a representative republic that was created more than 200 years ago is the end-all, be-all, that there isn't already a government that does it better than the United States? There must be, right? I mean, the so, United States is one of the oldest governments in the world. The Constitution is the oldest governing document, as I understand it, in the world. Mm -hmm. So somebody who's come along after that must have set up a government that's better. There's been a lot of socialism in the process, but somebody, maybe this parliamentary process, I don't have any idea. But I don't think that's the end of it either. I think that there are new governmental processes we haven't even considered yet. Now, I tend to believe... It all sounds awful to me. I tend to believe in competition, that people want governments. Governments, to me, them mean... Uh, you know, how are we going to be kept safe from the bad people? And so what they really mean is a protection service, a protection service that in some way, shape or form uh, competes against other protection services for your business is liable to be one that innovates and tries something new and comes up with something better. You can't try anything new in the United States. They're a monopoly and they will stop you from trying something new. Mm -hmm. uh, we had we had a friend who tried to set up a lemonade stand out in, um, on the uh, the the lawn there in Washington D.C. and uh, yeah. I think sell sell lemonade. They took him to jail. They drug yeah, him off right. to jail. This is how little. I think they dropped the charges later. But who cares? Yeah. This shows what a monopoly these people are. You can't sell lemonade out in front of their big white buildings, um, and that's just one piece of it all. Um, you can't try anything new or innovative in the area of governance in the United States. If I just, if I buy 500 acres and I say, you know what we're going to do, me and my friends, we're going to build our own little society here in New Hampshire, and uh, you're going to leave us alone. They are not going to leave you alone. They are going to demand money from you in the form of, uh, of taxes, especially mm -hmm. property taxes. Um, even if you stay on there, they want money from you to stay there. This isn't your land. I bought it. Well, it's not. But you thought. Yeah. You really didn't buy any land. If you think you own land, you're wrong. This is one of you're, the most enduring images from the 20th century. Sorry about that. You're renting it from the state, essentially. And it's, you're essentially a long, you've got, got a long-term lease, and that's all you've got. So, going on here, startup countries. We need startup countries, says Friedman, 37, an elfin man with a frenetic black hair. Today's governments work so poorly that feeling we could do better is pretty broad an entrepreneur would say here's an industry that's doing a horrible job so let's disrupt it with new technology seasteading is that technology i want to i guess inform you the listener who if you've listened to the show for a few weeks you've heard our friend rich paul on the air sitting in as uh, as a guest co-host on free talk live he was released from jail back in i think it was december or late november in 2013 after having spent the bulk of 2013, about nine months worth of the year, in jail. Uh, or as we call it, the Keen Spiritual Retreat, which we just so happened to talk about earlier this week. We have spent a full show actually talking about what makes that jail different and the, the warden who's unique and kind of more humane than the average jail warden. 
got a vice story, uh, an inter- a national story. About yeah, it. he was a major, major story. So uh, we were just talking about it, and now Rich, our friend, is sitting in the Keene Spiritual Retreat, a.k.a. the county jail, on what is called a violation of probation. Now, I've been through the, the court system as a criminal defendant in a bunch of cases that had no uh, victim. Mostly uh, civil disobedience. Yeah. Oriented. And so I've got some experience. I've also experienced the system through my friends who have also been in similar circumstances. But I have never really gone through anybody who's had a violation of probation situation. I was in jail with guys on violation of probation. So I know something about probation. I know that it's a fairly invasive thing that once you're on probation, there's this a lengthy agreement that you sign, and you're very, very restricted. You've got to check in with a probation officer in a lot of cases. They can come to your home. They can search through your stuff any old time they want to. Uh, You're not allowed to have alcohol. You're not allowed to have drugs. You're not allowed to have weapons. You're not allowed to be, in in some cases, in a uh, domicile with alcohol. It's true. Which can be really tough on your parents or your roommate. Right. So uh, anyway, there's... uh, our friend Rich Paul was arrested today for violating probation. Though the supposed reasons that he was arrested for uh, include the claim that he has been continuing to use cannabis and the claim that he had a weapon. And those are the two major, I think, claims against him in this case. And wasn't the weapon like a camera? The weapon was a monopod, which is different from a tripod in that it is only one leg instead of three. He was at a scene that we discussed earlier this week. Monday night, there were some local men who were chalking in downtown Central Square in Keene, New Hampshire. There were uh, there was at least one guy there from uh, the Stop Free Keene group who mm-hmm. was cleaning up that chalk. There was a verbal confrontation between the locals who were chalking and this individual who was cleaning it up. That escalated into a louder verbal confrontation. And then two other men from across the street came over. And uh, they came at Rich and uh, the other two men that were in the park and a couple of the others who were there as though they were going to fight them. There were some words exchanged previously where one of them specifically threatened a girl who was in the park. I mean, it was a bad, bad scene. And when these guys were coming, one of them was rolling up his sleeves. The other one throws his backpack down. I mean, these guys were coming at them in, in a violent manner. And the video has been linked to on, on freekeen.com if you haven't seen it yet. So Rich throws down his camera that he had, but disconnected the monopod from it first. So Rich held the monopod in his hands in case he needed to defend himself right. against the oncoming attackers. And luckily, I guess it makes some sense. <laughs> yeah, luckily he didn't have to defend himself. They ended up picking on one of the people who was the chalker. Again, there were these couple local guys that were chalking in the park uh, who are not free keen activists, just locals. And uh, so it was one of those guys who got attacked by the men who were coming at them. So Rich didn't have to use the monopod, but he did hold it. He did sort of, you know, wield it as though it were a weapon and the... Perhaps to dissuade somebody from uh, coming at him. The terms of probation say that a uh, you cannot have a weapon or a simulated weapon or something like this. You know, something that you make look like a weapon but might not actually have been a weapon, that kind of thing. It's pretty specific. So that's what they're coming after Rich for. We do not know how much time uh, you know he's going to get for this. It's my understanding that if you get a VOP, a violation of probation, you're at the judge's discretion as far as how much of the sentence that is currently suspended over his head. And I believe it's several years in prison mm-hmm. as a suspended sentence. I don't recall how many of the sentence was, but it seemed like it was three to seven. I forget the exact number. He could be going to prison this time. I mean, he was in jail last time for this this marijuana sales. Or it could be, you know, a slap on the hand. Maybe he'll get uh, three months instead of three years. It I, seems ridiculous to lock a man up.